<laughs> beauty. I think Holly, you want me to start off? Yeah, you're yeah. good to go. Okay, sounds good. Well, hello, and thank you for coming today. Again, I apologize for my mix up on timing. Um, my name is Dr. Kate Poos, my pronouns are she and her, and I reside, work, and play, and all the fun things on the traditional unceded territory of the Salmon people, uh, people of the river. I love the river. I run by, I run by the river. It's not everyone would consider running, but that's fine. But that's how I say, try to stay connected uh, to the land. So I'm going to give you a bit of a presentation on myself, who I am, what my research interests are, and maybe get some ideas from you as to where I can take things uh, here in the future. So this was me. And I like to show this picture to uh, my students because I teach a lot of pedagogy and I talk about what do you think was the sport experience of this delightful young child? And every judgment that people have is like completely right. Um, it was a fun but awkward childhood physically. So I grew up in the 80s, more in the 90s. And I did a lot of sports and activities that were meant for girls. So my brothers were doing soccer and baseball and I played soccer and baseball at the side of their practices because I had dance later that day in the figures game. Um, not that I didn't love those activities, I really did, but I was so small and so scrawny that I couldn't participate in a meaningful way into those other activities. So I did ballet when I was younger. I don't know why they made us wear socks with ballet slippers. This seems like a terrible idea, but it was good for fashion, I guess. Um, I was the first competitive rhythmic gymnast in the Fraser Valley, so I found that when I was about 13 years old, and that kind of sent me down that path. So it's a very small sport in this area. Huge sport in Europe and in Asia, but very small out here. So I started coaching very young because there were no other coaches. And I thought, no one else gets to do this if I don't step up and I don't coach. So that set me on a 25 year coaching binge, essentially. So I've coached um, mostly here in BC, but I've um, run coaching clinics from that across the country. So I've coached thousands of athletes and I've coached or, and thousands of coaches through the National Coaching Certification Program. So I've, I've done that both specific to gymnastics, but then also within multi-sport. So I will have a group of people coming from all different sports. So I'll have table tennis and equestrian and soccer, everything all in one room, which is really cool for the sharing of ideas. So then I, because I was coaching, I was then working in the administration of coaching, the administration of, of uh, education and sport. And so that's what I've done for the last 20 years because I've worked within sport administration. So, and that started to conclude just as I was finishing my PhD. So, my education, I tried to find an old school logo of like, because when I graduated, it was UCSB, like University College of the Fraser Valley. Um, and then I did, uh, it, at the time, it was a bachelor's in kinesiology and physical education, and it was working towards um, getting nice to courses in business because I knew I wanted to work within sport and men. And, work on these education programs. Um, I did my UBC, or I did my master's at UBC with a focus in uh, human kinetics and coaching sciences. And I focus on the professionalization of coaching. So what does that look like? How are coaches professionals? How are they not professionals? What does that look like as a profession? Which again, is super fun and super nerdy. Um, and then I went into my, um, my PhD, which was in uh, interdisciplinarity. Um, so it technically wasn't in kinesiology. Um, and it, it brought in a bunch of different disciplines, and this kind of an approach is really meant for when the research questions aren't going to fit into one box. So we really need to reach outside and grab at different places. So I, I had kinesiology and education and business that I brought in there. And I focused on evaluation, leadership, and coaching. So when someone goes out to evaluate a coach, how consistently are they doing that? What makes them good at it? What makes them bad at it? So it's kind of those aspects that I was interested in. And then I also did diploma in university teaching. So throughout all of this, I've lived in Chilliwack the whole time. I've never left, but I've never done a program in Chilliwack because the Kines program, when I was an undergrad, was in Oxford. So driving here to teach is like five minutes, and it's the coolest thing ever because I've never had this. So it's really exciting for me. When I was working uh, previously in Portsmouth, I was commuting to downtown Vancouver, which is like, that's far. I don't want to do that again. So that's, that's the plan, is to not do that again. <laughs> So some of my other backgrounds, so I, I was a, a lifeguard and first aid instructor, so I started um, teaching other adults in, in kind of classroom settings when I was quite young. 
Um, I started to, or I got all of my qualifications through the National Coaching Certification Program, and then I went on to teach those programs. So I'm a certified learning facilitator and coach evaluator and master coach developer in the NCCC. Uh, I'm also a chartered professional coach with the Coaching Association of Canada, which is the highest designation of coaching that you can get in the country. So it's uh, the Olympic and Paralympic coaches, and then a, a, a kind of a handful of other coaches throughout the country because I don't coach at a high performance level. Um, I've been a coach and a mentor, uh, the judge of the Special Olympics, and I develop education programs mostly in sport. And now I branched out and I started to uh, work in health as well. So that's some of the other fun things that I've gotten to do. So, how I started to get into my research was after I did my master's, which was a non thesis based program. Um, I got into doing a research, I was asked to be part of a research project, and it was an across Canada research project looking at how courses were being delivered in baseball, hockey, hockey and soccer. So it was those three sports specifically. I didn't have a background in any of those sports. I didn't know about them specifically. There's politics in every sport. But I had a lot of experiences with this project that um, really set me on the course to do my PhD and take on my research interests. So the first aha moment, which really isn't listed on here, was that I had to go in and watch someone teach a baseball coaching course, and I had to decide if they were good at it or not. And as I was doing it, I was like, I can do this. It's the same thing. It's the same thing in gymnastics and baseball and hockey. And so it's the same thing. So yes, this is something I can do. So then that set me on developing a whole bunch of programs which, which were then nationally implemented across all sports, which was really cool. But one of the um, data collection pieces that we did in going to watch these courses, we had hired a contractor and he was observing courses somewhere else. I won't say the sport, I won't say the location. He went in and then he's like, he's texting, he's like, okay, I'm here, I'm like, yeah, it's great. And he's like, okay, I'm watching. And the facilitator is telling the class when to use the F word with their athletes. And I'm like, uh, okay. And he's like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, you don't do anything. You're the researcher. You watch, like write it down. And he's like, but they, like, you can't teach this. This is ridiculous. You can't teach coaches to swear with their athletes. I'm like, well, I get that. But you're not allowed to interfere. You're the researcher. <laughs> and in this kind of research, you wouldn't interfere. So, well, I had a lot of reflection on that and kind of went, who trained this guy? Like, who taught him? Because he was doing it with a lot of confidence. Like, the coaches thought, yeah, this is what we're supposed to be doing. Who's going to evaluate him? Who's in charge of him? Um, would he show that behavior to an evaluator? So if he knew someone was coming in and watching him, would he do the same thing? Would his evaluator be able to get him to change his behavior? So if that had been a part of it, where someone was going to sit down with him and be like, you know, you're not supposed to teach coaches how to swear with their athletes. Would he get that? Would he understand that he has to change his behavior? And how are the coaches going to be impacted by this? What's, are they going to go ahead and do that with their athletes? Did the coaches know that maybe this guy isn't really teaching within the book? Like, what's going on? And are the other facilitators like this? Like, is this consistent across this sport, across this area? Like, what's going on? So that led to a whole thing about leadership. In, in sport and delivering education programs and wanting to know more about that because there's, there's almost no research on this in Canada, actually anyway. So I got really curious and I'm really nerdy and I really got to kind of embrace that bit. I did look into doing a PhD after my master's, um, but I had young kids, I couldn't move and I'm like, and I kind of joked and I'm like, I got to make friends with someone and they're gonna have to accept me into their program without me moving because I can't move. So sure enough, that's what happened with that research project. And the guy who was leading it was like, there were a lot of things that went wrong with that project. It was really messy. And he was like, well, you didn't mess that up that badly. Do you want to do a PhD? Well, he didn't say that. He said something a lot more colorful, but that's fine. And I'm like, yeah, I would like to do it, but I can't move. And he was like, okay, great. No problem. You don't have to move. You can stay there. I'll get the first couple of years paid for it. It was like, well, yeah. It's like, sold. Let's, let's do that. That sounds good. Um, so that kind of got me on that direction. And then we started to go through all of these, like, what are all the questions that we have? And I've got like files and files of, of just what are the questions that we have? So what kind of systems do we have that are currently supporting or inhibiting these coach developers, the people who are leading these workshops and evaluating coaches? 
Um, how is effectiveness defined for these for this group? How can they become more effective? So if we haven't even defined what effective is, how do we get them better? We don't know what good is. How consistently are these evaluators being or these evaluations being performed? So if I go, Cody, Cody, if I go to evaluate Cody and you go to evaluate Cody, are we going to come up with the same answer? And why and why not? And what does that mean about Cody as a coach? Right? So it's those kinds of things that I was really interested in. So, and then what factors contribute um, to the approach of the evaluation? So does the sport really impact how you approach an evaluation? Does the region, does the person, does the person's values, so all of those things. So I've been a part of a, quite a few research projects now. I say quite a few, but I still feel like I'm a pretty novice researcher in comparison to a lot of my colleagues. Um, so I worked on the uh, NCCP, the Learning Facilitator's Efficacy. So that was the one that I had all the Mahalo ones with. Um, some about coach evaluations. Some uh, we worked on one about coaching in BC specifically. And then my dissertation was about master coach developers and how they build their confidence and confidence in their actions. So those were the the few research projects that I've gotten to do so far. So my research approach in general, I look at a subjective ontology. So that's the nature of reality. So it's subjective. So there isn't the way that I do research and the types of research questions that I ask. It's not something that we can make objective. It's not something we can say, well, this is the truth. This is the, this is the only way to look at it. This is the answer. That might be appropriate in other forms of kinesiology and other, other ways of studying. It's not appropriate for what I do because we don't want to discount anyone's experience because your experience is how you use it. And then to lead on to that, the epistemology, so how we come to learn and understand reality is constructivist. And that means we build. We build knowledge based on what we've known before and then what we've learned and we construct and we build something together. So that's the qualitative research. Okay. So my research interests in general, I say are andragogical leadership in sport. So we have pedagogy, and pedagogy means child, and we're teaching learning of a child, pedagogy, and andragogy, andragogy means adult. Okay, so that's andragogy versus pedagogy. Some people use pedagogy as a catch-all for teaching and learning, that's fine. Some people argue it, I don't really care to, it doesn't really matter to me, but pedagogy, andragogy, that's the difference in, in the actual terms. So I tend to focus more on the adults. So I want to know people who are delivering function courses, how good are they going to be? So teachers who are delivering, uh, coaches who are delivering, that's who I want to focus on are, are those roles. So I want to look at andragogical leadership in other contexts. So again, maybe PE teachers, um, maybe specific kinds of coaching. I want to look at training and evaluation in leadership of, of these teaching learning programs. And I want to look at other types of leadership in sports. So it might be organizational leadership. Um, it might be people who run nonprofit organizations and, and how, how they can succeed and what holds them back. And then I do, I am interested in pedagogical leadership as well. So that's another part that, that I do feel strongly about as a coach. I've been coaching kids for a long time. I'm still very interested in it, but um, I am really interested in those that the adult factors as well. So I explained the pedagogy versus pedagogy. Um, I won't go into this, but this is a, just a little bit more about andragogy. So it talks about for adult learners, like what do you need as an adult learner, which is a bit different than, than child learners. So it talks about what is your readiness to learn and what is the, your prior experience learning and how do you kind of build on that? So again, won't, I'll leave that one alone. I think it's cool, but not everyone is as nerdy as me and that's okay. Um, so some of the future research that I'm going to do, I haven't actually started a new research project yet and that's intentional because I want to be really careful before I go from there. But some of the things that have stood out to me in the research, so there was um, a little piece in one of the research projects where it's talking, asking coaches, and it was um, something along the lines of what, what's preventing you from coaching? What's preventing you from doing the things you want to do? And the number one answer is politics. And I don't know what that means. Like I can guess it kind of what I think that means, but I want to better understand like well, when a coach can't coach what they want to coach, and it's because of politics, what do they mean by that? And then what can we understand from what they're saying so that we can make changes so that that barrier can be reduced? So I'm interested in that. I'm interested a lot in the social justice lenses. So the experience of, of female leaders, um, the experience of well, everyone actually, but, but I'm interested in those perspectives as well. And that's it. And on that note, 
Today is voting day. So please make sure you vote. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Um, are there any specific sports that you're interested in researching and some of the coaching? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I, um, because I was with a really, really small sport, I couldn't learn everything I wanted to learn just within that sport. So I became very multi-sport. Like, well, what can I take from, from artistic swimming? What can I take from water polo? What can I take? So I really opened up really, really big and I try and take from everywhere. Where I'm probably most interested are those small sports, are those low capacity sports, are the sports that not a lot of people are participating in. Um, and, and just because they tend to function a little bit differently. You know, there's two people working at the national office and one of them's a volunteer and they're both on a kitchen team. So I, I want to know more about how they're doing and, and what can be done to help them because they have little to no resources. So that's interesting. Yeah, do you have like a timeline of when you want to start promising your future research? Ooh, good question. I met with the research office actually on Friday, and I kind of said, this is what I'm thinking of doing. And so we're kind of um, getting up to my ideas, and I'm looking for other, other people to work with at USC, because I haven't worked with many other people at USC. either. the research teams that I've worked with. Um, there's not a lot of people at USC who study what I study, so my research teams have been across the country, so I have to find some other people I want to work with. Well, I'd like to most of them. And then will you have more race as well, or this is what? I don't know yet, to be honest. And, and those were some of my questions as well, is, is how can that happen? Because, yeah, that was really cool. Mm -hmm. The research methodologies that I use are very are very personal in that the way that you use language and the way you do it, it's not as easy as, like, I'll do the interview, you transcribe it. Like, it doesn't quite look like that. So I have to figure out how that's going to work um, with bringing multiple people, to be totally honest. So there's just a bunch of those things that I've got to figure out. But, yeah, I hope to. Awesome. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We'll end the recording. So, 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 so. You're all good. <laughs>